Sam already mentioned that I was chief medical resident at what was then called the West Roxbury Veterans Affairs Hospital under Dr. Sasahara. I was completing my senior residency at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And those who've interacted with the senior residents at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, then the Peterman Brigham Hospital, know that you can't teach them anything about medicine because they think they know it all. Mm -hmm. But when I served as Dr. Sasahara's chief resident, we encountered a lot of administrative issues and some very delicate and challenging personnel issues. And I was totally unprepared to deal with them. And Dr. Sasahara would invite me into his office. And he had a device. Now, I know we're supposed to use only generic names in this kind of talk, but it, I think it's called an insincorator. So this is off-label. And it had a spigot that served boiling hot water. This was quite a novelty at that time. And he would make a cup of tea, offer me a cup of tea. And you know, in some cultures, tea has ceremonial attributes as well as just being a beverage. And I knew when I was sharing a cup of tea with Dr. Sasahara in his office that I had to listen very carefully because I was about to learn something very important about interpersonal relationships, about how to conduct myself in a professional manner, how to deal with difficult administrative issues in a sensitive and fair way. And I remember some of the specific issues which we adjudicated during those mentoring sessions that I had with Dr. Sasahara. So not only did I learn from him about medicine, despite being a Brigham resident, but I learned invaluable lessons which I still apply and aspire to do as well as he has done in my administrative work. Now, we have... Uh, online supplements in our publications, and so I call your attention to online supplements this talk, because I could spend the entire time extolling Dr. Sasahara. So I was interviewed uh, by Dr. Goldhaber a few times, and you can find on YouTube the interactions, the interview, and uh, learn more in depth about what I learned from Dr. Sasahara and his accomplishments. Well, now to the science of the day. I'm going to divide my talk into uh, three parts. First, everyone will be abreast of, and that is the uh, really wrenching changes in our understanding of the pathogenesis of the thrombotic complications of atherosclerosis. Then a middle part where I'm going to invite you into the laboratory and give you some details, experimental details, and so you're welcome to take a little nap during that session because at the end I'm going to summarize all of the basic science in one slide. And then in a coda, I'm going to conclude with some thoughts about how a biological process that has preoccupied me in my laboratory life for a quarter century, inflammation, links to thrombosis and has some bottom lines for you to consider in your practices. So the traditional view of the transition from the stable phase of atherosclerosis to its unstable thrombotic manifestations is that there's a progressive accumulation on the artery wall of a cholesterol-laden waxy debris until you get such a critical pinpoint narrowing that just a few platelets could come and cause occlusion of the artery and lead to the dreaded thrombotic complications of this disease. Now, if you stop and think about it, these lesions spend decades growing in our arteries. But all too often, the first manifestation of atherosclerosis clinically is sudden death or an acute heart attack or a stroke. And we take for granted that there is this sudden transition but the mechanisms that account for this light switch going off, this thunderbolt that leads to the transition from chronic stable disease to the acute thrombotic manifestations really is something that requires some explanation. So we have spent a lot of time in the last couple of decades in trying to take this transition apart. And the first issue is that 
that textbook model of how atherosclerosis works with progressive continuous luminal narrowing leading to a critical thrombosis turns out not to fit the clinical and pathological observations that we've accumulated over the last couple of decades. So the long-held conception of how this disease develops turns out to be wrong. The clinical evidence that caused us to reconsider this traditional pathway comes from several independent threads. And I think you're familiar with them, and I'll just review them quickly. The data that we acquired in the dawn of the thrombolytic era when people were giving thrombolytic therapy and then doing angiograms and finding to their great surprise, it was actually difficult to publish at the time, that once the culprit thrombus had been lysed, that the underlying atheroma was not always occlusive. In almost half the cases, the underlying atherosclerotic plaque was not causing a critical stenosis. Then there were the results of serial angiographic studies. When people happened to have had an angiogram in the weeks to months before an index myocardial infarction, and one could go back on the prior angiogram and ask, what did the side of today's thrombotic complication look like? And again, the studies were actually hard to publish. There were at least three or four independent studies done in this manner from three countries and two continents, and they were highly concordant. And again, the contrarian conclusion of these studies was that the culprit of today's myocardial infarction was only a critical flow-limiting stenosis in a minority, perhaps under 20% of cases of acute myocardial infarction. And then we learned a great deal about the clinical biology of this disease by applying a mostly research tool in the cath lab, and that is intravascular ultrasound, when one can take a cross-sectional picture of the coronary artery in the living patient using a little echo probe that's mounted on the tip of a catheter. And when you do that, and one of the practitioners of this is Steve Nissen, you see that it's not the narrow part of the artery that seems to be causing the problem in this patient with an ACS, but here, where we have this little dimple of contrast that's been extravasated from the lumen of the vessel. Let's look at that again, because I'm showing you both the angiogram and the ultrasound. And you see that the problem is actually here, where there is an ulcer in the plaque that has allowed the blood to enter this nefarious region in the core of the plaque. Now, one can actually look at atherosclerotic plaques non-invasively using contemporary radiologic techniques such as computed tomographic angiography. And here is another example. Look, the eye of the angiographer is immediately drawn, we call this in cardiology the oculostenotic reflex, to the narrow part of the artery. We have worshipped for decades in cardiology at the altar of stenosis. But the actual problem in these patients with acute coronary syndromes is this spot where there is, again, this extravasated contrast that has entered the artery wall. And these are several cases, and I, in a rather puckish manner, have chosen them because these people with acute coronary syndromes had calcium scores of zero and might have been patted on the back and told by an imager that they had extremely low risk of an acute coronary syndrome. Now, contemporary systematic evaluation of atherosclerotic lesions have also shown that it's not always the tight stenosis that is the focus of the interventionalist that is causing the next problem in patient. Now, this is the famous prospect study, which enrolled people who were undergoing percutaneous intervention and then followed them up after having carefully looked at the plaques by angiography and by advanced ultrasound techniques. And the bottom line of this slide from last year from the New England Journal is that when you look at all recurrent events in this several year follow-up study, that the recurrent events can be parsed into two baskets. 
those that were caused by the culprit lesion that was considered by the interventionalist to be the target at the first sitting. And about half of the recurrent events or of the events in this follow-up period were caused by non-culprit lesions that had evaded the attention of the interventionalist. So I think that even these contemporary, very well-treated patients teach us that it isn't always the tight stenosis that gives rise to the atherosclerotic plaque. And once again, turning to the non-invasive imagers, I think that this is a uh, study which was pioneering and is not well enough publicized. And this is a tabular data, and that may be one of the reasons, because it's sort of hard to get at. But these investigators at the Mass General Hospital studied by computed tomographic angiography lesions that were culprits of acute coronary syndromes and lesions that were stable. And let me take this apart for you. Okay. The focus here, and focus on the degree of stenosis. You notice that the degree of stenosis is exactly the same in stable lesions or in culprit lesions. But if you look at the outer vessel area, okay, that looks the perimeter of the whole artery, it's much, much bigger in the culprit lesions of acute coronary syndromes. The plaque area is also greater, despite having the same degree of stenosis. And so what happens in atherosclerosis is that there is an outward remodeling of the artery that accommodates the growth of the plaque without protruding into the lumen. And it seems to be those plaques that protrude outwards, not inwards, that are associated with acute coronary syndromes. You'll notice if you calculate what they call the remodeling index, that it's much higher in the culprit lesions than in the stable lesions. So that was an initial small kind of pilot observation. And this consortium, mostly Japanese investigators, followed up a thousand, more than a thousand patients who'd undergone CTA and asked the questions, what are the characteristics of plaques by CTA, by computed tomographic angiography, a non-invasive technique, that correlate with developing acute coronary syndromes? And what they found was that there were two features, radiographically, that correlated with propensity of a plaque to cause an acute coronary syndrome. Low attenuation. Now, isn't, isn't that strange? Because everyone's going looking for calcified lesions to stratify risk. But it's the non-calcified lesions, the ones that are the opposite of calcified, that have little attenuation in the x-ray beam that are causing the mischief. And those that are, as the Mass General Group previously reported, outward remodeled. And you see here, if you have z uh, one feature positive, you were here, two feature negative here, but if you had two features, you had a much higher rate. Both, that is both low attenuation and both outward remodeling, your clinical course was much worse. And here again is just an example from this study. So this is the baseline CTA showing one of these low attenuation and eccentrically outward remodeled plaques shown at at higher magnification here. See, there's a lot of calcium speckling here. But the place that caused six months later the acute coronary syndrome is not the place where there's calcium, but the place where there was this eccentric remodeling and not a site of tight stenosis. So that's the kind of clinical data that has really revolutionized our thinking about this disease. We grew up thinking that this disease worked like rust clogging a pipe, but the data tell us differently. So what is the pathophysiology of the thrombotic complications of atherosclerosis? Well, actually, this has been known for, for generations. Pathologists hard at work in their autopsy suites, uh, in their laboratories, were trying to tell us in cardiology that it is a physical disruption of the atherosclerotic plaque that is the substrate for most thrombotic events that cause death. By far and away, the two most common forms of disruption of the plaque 
are a rupture of the plaque's fibrous cap. So this is a cross-section through a slice of the pie of an atheromatous artery. This is the middle layer of the artery. This is the inner layer of the artery, which is usually quite thin and delicate. But in an atheromatous plaque, it becomes stuffed with these inflammatory cells and lipid debris. And this is the fibrous cap that ordinarily overlies the lipid core of the atherosclerotic plaque. And you see here, we've depicted it fracturing and causing a blood clot. There is a second minority mechanism that accounts for somewhere between a fifth and a quarter of acute fatal myocardial infarctions, and that is caused by a superficial erosion of this innermost layer of the artery that leads to a thrombus. These other mechanisms account for only single-digit percents of fatal acute myocardial infarction. So let's focus on the most frequent cause of fatal acute myocardial infarction. That is a fracture of the plaque's fibrous cap. So here's the thrombus that killed the patient. This is an artery, particularly at physiologic pressure in the living individual, that was by no means critically narrowed, a widely patent lumen, and that would have looked normal or near normal on an angiogram, and certainly not caused any concern on the part of an angiographer. And yet, this plaque caused the death of the patient because of this fracture of the fibrous cap. This is a preparation of my colleague, collaborator, and friend, Marie de Lourdes Higuchi in Sao Paulo. So we were focused on these pathological changes in our laboratory because of this confluence of the pathological data and the clinical data that cast doubt on our traditional concept. And so we focused in the laboratory on what it is that might cause a failure of this protective fibrous cap that's all that stands between many of our patients and acute myocardial infarction or sudden cardiac death. And just in case you think that this rupture of the fibrous cap is an artifact post-mortem, I showed you using intravascular ultrasound that there was a discontinuity in the innermost layer of the artery that it was associated with extravasation of contrast, but with a newer technique known as optical coherence tomography, or OCT, you can really get a beautiful view, much clearer than in the ultrasound, of a fracture of the plaque's fibrous cap. And you can also make out mural thrombi that are the nidus for many unstable coronary syndromes. So the pathologists had carefully done morphometric studies. They counted up the cells. They measured everything under the microscope. And one of the leading lights of this uh, era was the late Michael Davies from St. George's in London. And they taught us, capturing our attention with their lovely photomicrographs, but also because they actually provided quantitative data on analysis of plaques, that plaques that cause fatal acute myocardial infarction had large lipid pools. Isn't that reminiscent of those large, low attenuation plaques that the imagers have taught us about? They have lots of inflammatory cells, and we'll come to that in a moment. They have thin protective fibrous caps, less than 65 microns. And that's intuitive, because you think that if the plaque is thin, that it may be less likely to withstand the hemodynamic stresses of the arterial circulation. And I won't go into this property, which is nonetheless important for lack of time. Now, what is it that makes the fibrous cap tough and resistant to rupture? It's because there's a molecule which abounds in the fibrous cap known as collagen. These are interstitial collagens, and there's a photomicrograph here that shows the structure of fibrillar collagen. This is a molecule which is as strong as steel wires of similar caliber, and that is the same structural molecule that gives strength to our skin, that gives strength to our tendons. It's the reason that I can stand here 
is because of interstitial collagen. And it is the principal component of the fibrous cap that confers biomechanical strength. So now we were armed with a hypothesis that we could take into our basic science laboratory. So this is now nap time if you, you uh, got up early to come here, because I'm going to take you into the laboratory. So we had a hypothesis that perhaps some of the processes which we had been studying under the hood of the atherosclerotic plaque might decrease the ability of cells in the plaque, principally the arterial smooth muscle cell, to make new collagen. Now, collagen synthesis is very complicated. Of course, the DNA gets transcribed to RNA, and the RNA gets translated to protein. But in the case of collagen, that's only the beginning of the story. It's a long road that requires post-translational modification. Prolines get hydroxylated. Sugar moieties, sugar molecules get added. Uh, there's processing, self-assembly into these cables. Those who've had the opportunity of walking across the pedestrian path of the Golden Gate Bridge have seen the exhibit there that's a cross-section of one of the cables that holds that bridge up. And it is an example of art or architecture or engineering imitating life, because this is exactly what those cables look like that are holding up the Golden Gate Bridge. Now, the collagen molecule is, of course, made up of amino acid building blocks. And it is rather monotonous during much of the stretch of the mature interstitial collagen molecule. There are repeating units of glycine, proline, and an amino acid that's derived from proline, hydroxyproline. So we can use in the laboratory the trick of feeding some isolated cultured smooth muscle cells grown in a petri plate, radioactively labeled proline, and then separating the proteins that have incorporated radioactive proline by electrophoresis, a method for separating the proteins, and then sticking that electrophoretogram on some x-ray film so that where the radioactive amino acid has been incorporated, the band will darken the film, just like in a photograph. And what this experiment shows I think this is the only gel I'm going to show in this talk, is that when you have smooth muscle cells under these artificial conditions and growing in the laboratory, that they incorporate proline into newly synthesized collagen chains. And the smooth muscle cell is the major factory for collagen in the artery wall. When we expose those smooth muscle cells to mediators that we know are operating in the atherosclerotic plaque, such as platelet-derived growth factor, transforming growth factor beta, we rev up new collagen synthesis. Okay? And that's probably very important in healing. But what's most remarkable in the context of weakening of the plaque's fibrous cap is what's shown in the last lane, that when we expose those cells to a mediator of inflammation that's produced by activated inflammatory cells in the plaque, we call this mediator interferon gamma, that we virtually shut down new collagen synthesis. And in fact, in this publication, which is now um, two decades old, we were able to show that the messenger RNA levels that encode the pro-collagen isoforms are decreased by gamma interferon, and that even when we maximally stimulated collagen synthesis, we were able to bring the rate of new collagen synthesis to baseline or below by concubating with this inflammatory mediator. So we had now reason to believe that, that there was a defect in collagen synthesis required to repair and maintain that fibrous cap that protects the plaque from rupture when we had inflammation in the plaque. And then we could turn to the other side of the equation because any macromolecule like, like collagen depends not just on its rate of synthesis, but also on its rate of breakdown. And collagen is ordinarily an extremely stable molecule, one that resists most proteolytic enzymes in the body. The enzymes that can break down this tightly wound triple helix that causes the collagen to form are members of a family of enzymes known as matrix metalloproteinases. And there's really only a handful of these enzymes 
in the human body that can make the initial attack on collagen, breaking it into fragments that allow it to undergo further degradation. And these matrix metalloproteinase, or MMP collagenases, are extremely tightly controlled. And you will notice that when you make this first step in breaking down collagen that breaks it into three-quarter and one-quarter fragments, that you uncover a new, we call it the carboxyl terminus, the end of the molecule. Instead of being here, it's now here. And that uncovers a spot in the molecule that we can recognize with an antibody. We call it a neoepitope. And when we take that antibody and use it as a reagent to ask the question, do we have partially broken down collagen in a particular place in an artery, we can take a cross-section through the artery, and this is a cross-section through a human atherosclerotic plaque. This is the lumen where the blood flows. This is that lipid core would be over here. And this is the shoulder region of the plaque, the transition between that more normal area and the plaque itself. And you see this green fluorescence shows binding of an antibody that specifically recognizes that new end, that neoepitope of the partially cleaved interstitial collagen. Surrounds an area of intact collagen, and it co-localizes with inflammatory cells that are overexpressing, as shown by this purple staining, two flavors of these matrix metalloproteinase interstitial collagenases. So we have very good reason to believe that three flavors, this is the third flavor of interstitial collagenase, uh, MMP8, are overexpressed in the atherosclerotic plaque. So our laboratory studies led us to this model that when we have inflammation in the atherosclerotic plaque, the T lymphocyte, shown here in blue, can send an inhibitory signal to this new muscle cell, causing it to put a break on new collagen synthesis. By the same token, we worked out signals through which the T cell could rev up the synthesis of these collagenolytic enzymes that could attack the collagen and so when we have inflammation in the plaque, it puts the collagen fiber, which lends strength to the fibrous cap and resists rupture, in double jeopardy. Decreased synthesis and increased breakdown. And that sets the stage for the acute coronary syndromes. So, so far, we have a lot of circumstantial evidence. We have observations in situ in human tissues. We have a bunch of petri plate experiments. Uh, but how do we close the loop of causality rather than just association? Well, for that, we use genetically altered mice. And I'm going to quickly take you through some actual experiments showing you causality of these enzymes and collagen metabolism. This is what my kids call TMI, too much information. So if you're napping, you can stay napping. And I will summarize the results at at the end of this little section. So we're going to delve now into a genetically modified mouse where there's been a mutation introduced into the pro-collagen gene that renders the collagen a non-substrate for the collagenase enzymes. We can then, after two years of preliminary work constructing these animals, do an experiment where we coax the mice to consume a diet such as you will find on Boylston Street at the fast food joints. And then we can take a cross-section at the level of the aortic root here of the atherosclerotic vessel. These are the sinuses of Valsalva. And we can stain with a beautiful stain that gives you bright orange birefringence under polarization optics for interstitial collagen. You see here's a plaque that's pretty confluent in this sinus of Valsalva, an animal that is atherosclerosis susceptible, this is a mutation that confers atherosclerosis susceptibility, and has wild-type collagen. This plaque has some collagen, not much collagen, and this plaque, incomplete collagenization of that plaque. But in the animal that has the mutant form of collagen that resists the collagenase, we see confluent collagen in all three plaques in these sinuses of Alsalva. And we can quantitate that very nicely. 
and show no matter how you slice or dice it, that in the animal that resists collagen analysis, that there is more collagen shown in the orange bars than in the wild type collagen shown in the yellow bars. So in that experiment, we mutated the substrate, but I already told you that there is a handful of enzymes. So can we do the converse experiment, mutate the enzymes, and reinforce that conclusion? And so this is an example of doing that, where we have introduced a mutation that inactivates MMP13 into an atherosclerotic animal. Again, uh, a year or so of, of uh, work to generate the compound mutant mouse. Then we do the cholesterol feeding experiment. And lo and behold, we get the same answer. We can mutate one of these enzymes and get a reinforcement in collagen in the lesion. So compare this fibrous cap to this fibrous cap. And at the latter time point measured, we get a significant accumulation of collagen comparing the yellow bars to the gray bars. And I won't bore you with another enzyme that we believe is an activator of the enzyme that we just talked about. So these experiments with germline modifications, you know, modifications to the level of the genome, showed that if you have a defect in either the substrate or the enzyme from birth on, that you can coax collagen to accumulate in the plax fibrous cap. But that begs two questions. Uh, one is that we've learned that there are often workarounds when you have a congenital absence of an enzyme, particularly when there is redundancy, and you could rev up another enzyme that could make a compensatory change. And then also, if you want to think translationally, well, would it be a therapeutic opportunity to go in with an inhibitor of an enzyme in a person who already has plaques and try to block one of these enzymes. So more recently, one of my postdoctoral fellows, Thibaut Kiar, has asked the question, can pharmacologic collagenase inhibition increase collagen content of plaques in mice with already established atherosclerosis? So this is important for us scientifically to get around that compensatory change issue, and also therapeutically, because if you can't change collagen content without inhibiting it, uh, the enzymes from birth, then it's not medically relevant. So uh, last year, Thibault published the first part of this work. And he used a technique that's very important for us going forward in the experimental lab and hopefully eventually in people, which is called molecular imaging, to actually show that under the circumstances that we were using for pharmacologic inhibition of this enzyme, it was actually working. And you heard from Mark Sabatine, the wisdom of our mentor, Dr. Bromwald, that a lot of phase three trials fail because you get the dose wrong. And so you really need to have tools that you can use to say that the dose that I'm using of an intervention is actually having the biological effect on the target. And here in the carotid artery atherosclerotic plaques in a mouse, Using intravital microscopy, the red signal corresponds to inflammatory cells, macrophages. The green shows the activity of one of these enzymes that breaks down collagen, MMP13. And here, when you put the red and green together, you get yellow, showing co-localization, showing that the inflammatory cells in this mouse lesion are indeed the cells that are localizing with the collagenase. And now, you can use the intravital microscope to make things spin around and make these very pretty pictures uh, like this. It doesn't add any scientific information, but it's rather aesthetically pleasing. So even though it increases the file size of my presentations a lot, I include this little image. But so here's the, the utilization of this molecular imaging technology is actually to show that when we give the oral inhibitor of MMP13 that we're able to actually hit our target, decrease MMP13 activity. We don't decrease the accumulation of macrophages. And here then is the bottom line. When we use an orally available MMP13 inhibitor, we're able to increase the collagen content in the plaque, just like the germline mutations. And indeed, when we do further analysis, 
to look at the collagen content of the fibrous cap, we see that it's increased when we administer this orally available MMP13 inhibitor. So now you can wake up. This is the summary of the animal experiments that studies in atherosclerotic mice demonstrate that plaque collagen accumulates in animals that have a mutation that makes their collagen resistant to collagenases, in animals that have a defect in a, some enzymes that break down collagen, and when we do pharmacologic inhibition of MMP13. So we're now able to conclude from this coalescence of clinical observations or pathological observations and biochemical and laboratory observations and now in vivo experiments in mice, both pharmacologic and genetic, that collagenases critically influence collagen accumulation in mouse atheromata. And I won't go into the um, career-long hobby that I've had in proteinases, but we also have implicated other families of proteinases in plaque biology and in aneurysm formation as well. So I've tried to convince you that inflammation is critical in regulating the friability of the plaque's fibrous cap. But what about the other side of that equation, and that is the thrombus. It would matter little if there were a fracture of the plaque's fibrous cap if it were not for the ensuing thrombus. So I've talked to you about the factors that weaken the fibrous cap, decreased synthesis of collagen, increased breakdown of collagen, but what about the thrombogenicity of the lipid core. What is it that makes it so dangerous for the blood to gain access to this compartment in the plaque? Three laboratories, not our own, back 15 or 20 years ago, pointed to tissue factor as the key trigger to thrombosis in disrupted atherosclerotic plaques. But the mystery was, what is it that triggers the expression of tissue factor by cells, notably macrophages, in the atherosclerotic plaque. And what Francois Mach and Uwe Schoenbeck were able to do when they were fellows in our laboratory was make the link with inflammation. And they showed that ligating an inflammatory receptor, CD40, on the macrophages would stimulate tissue factor gene expression. So now we can flesh out this cartoon. Inflammation not only regulates the collagen content of the fibrous cap, but also CD40 ligation on the macrophage can increase tissue factor procoagulant. So inflammation critically regulates both the fragility of the plaque and its thrombogenicity. So I'd like to conclude now with some thoughts about the interrelations between inflammation and thrombosis. What uh, Dan Simon and I called the clot thickens when you mix inflammation and thrombosis. And this diagram from our little piece in circulation from over a decade ago makes the point that it's a positive feedback loop. And why did we say that? Well, it's because we usually think of thrombin as being an enzyme which can generate fibrinogen, fibrin from fibrinogen. But in addition, thrombin, through the protease-activated receptors, and we heard about the TRA2P study earlier today, the target of that vorapaxar is the protease-activated receptor, which is independent of thrombin's activity on fibrinogen. And not only do platelets have these PAR receptors, these protease-activated receptors that are activated by thrombin, but so too do smooth muscle cells and endothelial cells. And as Sam said earlier, we think of the platelet as a thrombocyte, but it also is a little cluster bomb for pro-inflammatory mediators. So when we have thrombin activation at near the bottom of the coagulation cascade that we saw very early on in Mark Sabatine's talk, we also are causing inflammatory responses on platelets and on smooth muscle cells and endothelial cells, cells that are intimately involved at the level of the atherosclerotic plaque. And that causes a release of inflammatory mediators that can then interact with the numerous phagocytic cells that are in the atherosclerotic plaque, causing oxidative stress 
increasing tissue factor expression and activity, causing them to pump out pro-inflammatory cytokines and also lipid mediators of inflammation. So we have to think of thrombosis not only in terms of clotting, but also as a pro-inflammatory stimulus. And indeed, not only do we affect the solid state of the plaque, but also the fluid phase of blood with inflammation, because whatever our pro-inflammatory risk factors are, could be dyslipidemia, could be hypertension, could be visceral adiposity, there's a first wave of pro-inflammatory cytokines that begets a second wave of messenger cytokines that then rev up the synthesis in the liver of fibrinogen, the precursor of clots, and plasminogen activator inhibitor, the major inhibitor of our endogenous fibrinolytic system. So I'd like to conclude my inaugural Sasahara lecture by conveying to you the concept of two states being important in thrombosis. This has nothing to do with Middle East peace. It has to do with the solid state of the plaque, with its determinants of plaque rupture and of thrombogenicity, which are regulated by inflammation, and also the fluid phase of blood, which, depending on what the levels are of plasminogen activator inhibitor, the levels of fibrinogen, and the circulating tissue factor-rich microparticles, you can have the same plaque disruption, but have either a subclinical mural thrombus that causes no problem and heals, at least in the short term, or you can have an abrupt, propagated, and sustained thrombus that would arrest blood flow and lead to a STEMI or sudden death. So the bottom line is that inflammation is a key to atherothrombosis, not only in the preclinical phase of this disease, but in its ultimate thrombotic complications. And I'd like to, to finish by restating what an honor it is to serve as the inaugural Arthur Sasahara Lecture, since I learned so much not just about medicine, but about leadership and humanity from Dr. Sasahara, and also to acknowledge my colleagues who contributed to the work that I was able to present to you from our laboratory. Thank you very much. Very thought-provoking. Um, I've been putting together in my mind uh, what the next decade is going to offer us. We talked about one decade ago with uh, Dr. Sasahara's non-retirement party at the Harvard Club, and I'm, I'm trying to take what you've been teaching us this morning uh, and just fast forward to 2022. We heard Mark Sabatine present the results with very tiny doses of rivaroxaban which I imagine uh, will be added on to the discharge medication regimen from uh, patients with acute coronary syndrome on top of the five or six other medications that these patients get. Do you think that we'll, a um, decade from now, pretty much routinely be adding on a pure anti-inflammatory drug to break the cycle uh, that you discussed? So the first part of the answer is that actually the best way to interrupt this process is with lifestyle intervention, number one. Uh, so if we could all remain physically active and have an appropriate diet, we could forestall a lot of the biology that I discussed. But of course, the genetic component uh, we can't control. That is a non-modifiable risk factor. You can't choose your parents. Uh, so even people with perfect lifestyles do have some susceptibility to this disease. Um, second point is that a body of work which I haven't been able to share with you today shows that lipid lowering by diet, or in particular statin therapy, which can have not only lipid lowering effects but direct anti-inflammatory effects, reverse a lot of this biology. We've shown that in several species. 
and we believe that it applies to humans as well. And I guess the third answer is that the hypothesis that you pose, and that is that direct anti-inflammatory agents may modify outcome and secondary prevention uh, after myocardial infarction is the subject of uh, clinical trials now. There are at least two um, that are, one is ongoing, the other is about to get underway. One is using an antibody that neutralizes one of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-1 beta, that is the CANTOS trial, being led by Paul Ritker, and also being led by Paul Ritker is the cardiovascular inflammation reduction trial, which is using weekly low-dose methotrexate in the uh, dose which has been transformative in the practice of uh, rheumatology, and which in the latest JAMA I was happy to learn that these disease-modifying therapies in rheumatology patients are not associated with a cancer signal. So as one of the investigators in Cantos, I was reassured by that finding. Um, and then the last answer is something you and I have discussed. And that is very provocative issue that anticoagulant or antithrombotic therapy might be anti-inflammatory. And it's like Judah Folkman, the late Judah Folkman said that he had a blackboard in his lab meeting room where they would write down hypotheses and then anyone who could think of a way to test the hypothesis could be first author. So for the young people in the room, there's a hypothesis and wouldn't it be fun to think of a way to back into it and then to prospectively test the hypothesis that perhaps, as you and I have discussed, aspirin treatment um, at doses which are not anti-inflammatory could have anti-inflammatory actions because they're arresting some of this positive feedback of the thickening clot. Questions? Uh... So the question was, does statins have any effect on the fibrous cap thickness? And uh, yes, they do in rabbits. Okay. Um, they have similar effects in mice. Uh, but most importantly, the human question is under investigation. Uh, some of the best data are from using radio frequency backscatter data from ultrasound. And one of my former postdoctoral fellows, Seiko Sugiyama, working uh, with his Hawagawa's group uh, now in Kumamoto, had published uh, evidence using radio frequency analysis of echoes that there is a reinforcement of the fibrous component of plaques uh, in intact humans who are treated with statins. Um, I'm hoping that some advanced analyses of some of the more recent studies uh, with intravascular ultrasound, where we actually have uh, some radio frequency data, uh, will allow us to test that hypothesis in a, in a more formalized way in a clinical trial setting. Dr. Levy, what an outstanding presentation. Being a student of inflammation and thrombosis, mostly from your writings, I, I just missed one point, maybe I didn't pay attention. You, you did not mention thrombin thrombomodulin thrombospondin in the equation which you taught us this morning. Um, no, because there hasn't been uh, a lot of links between the thrombomodulin system and inflammation, except in that, uh, of course, it can be a target of, of thrombin at lower doses. So I think that that's uh, uh, perhaps a missing link. 